how to optimize a young 35, 40 year old woman that is not uh, menopause, uh, postmenopausal yet. And uh, m maybe she's uh, symptomatic. She starts to struggle with weight gain, mood swings, and uh, maybe already some hormonal changes. Uh, how to go about that? And if this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe so you can learn more about fitness and nutrition, hormones and anti-aging, all this to optimize your life overall. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. Sure. At that age, you're going to start having some decline. And that's a great age to start You know, looking at when you're starting to have symptoms. But we always want to look at progesterone in a premenopausal woman. That's going to be the best treatment for her. Uh, it's going to treat PMS type symptoms. It can treat uh, hot flashes, the perimenopausal hot flashes. Um, those are not brought on by estrogen deficiency as they are in a menopausal woman. So it's going to be effective in that. Um, it's calming, it's mood stabilizing, and that's probably, I don't know, it's hard to pick that or um, thyroid and testosterone, but that's going to be one of the biggest game changers for a perimenopausal woman is progesterone. It helps with so many things and improves quality of life. It decreases her risk of breast cancer. Um, helps with bone, uh, bone strength. Progesterone, what um, delivery method and what dose are you talking about for premenopausal women? Okay. You would want to stay away from cream for sure because it doesn't raise blood to a therapeutic level. It's just not well absorbed through the skin. Uh, the highest I've, I've probably ever seen it on a cream is around three and we would want to get around 10. That's where they get symptom relief, a minimum of 10 in a perimenopausal woman. It's going to be different for postmenopause. Um, the sublingual is our choice because it's absorbed very well. You just place it under the tongue. It takes about four minutes to dissolve. It brings levels up beautifully. The only drawback to that, well, there's a couple. It does cause drowsiness. I mean, it does not cause drowsiness um, as the oral does, but um, it's not the most pleasant tasting hormone it's kind of a bitter hormone the pharmacies will put some uh, flavoring in to try to help women with that but um, it does raise blood levels really well sublingual but then oral is also a possibility uh, the problem with getting it orally is you only absorb about 40 percent and so sometimes you it's just not enough uh, it does cause drowsiness when you take it orally. So if women are having trouble sleeping at night, then that might be something good to consider. But usually you'll have to do a little bit of sublingual to go along with it to get it in a good range. So that's like, well, if you're going to do sublingual anyway, why not just do sublingual? And then you, you don't, it's just more cost effective if you're just doing, taking one trochee a day as opposed to having to take a trochee and a capsule. But, um, very few women can't tolerate it sublingual, and it's just going to be due to the taste that they don't like. Um, but if they do have trouble sleeping, we'll give them oral as well. If it's a postmenopausal woman, and she's on an oral estradiol tablet as well, and she's taking oral progesterone, then you end up having to give more estradiol because the oral progesterone will lower the levels when it's taken when they're taking oral estradiol. Okay, that's so you have to consider and that, but that's in a postmenopausal woman. Okay, but for this uh, pre-menopausal uh, woman, uh, sublingual progesterone, and what uh, levels in the blood are you aiming for? Usually around ten will give them symptom relief, but um, we also we give it to them starting like a two hundred milligram sublingual trochee, and um, they'll do one a day generally, and. But they can, all, they can go up to four trochees a day if they need to for PMS-type symptoms. Patients that have migraine headaches, really bad cramps, um, irritability, breast tenderness, they may go up to four trochees a day to minimize their symptoms. Okay. Uh, maybe I should have asked this question uh, before uh, the different hormones. But what, do, uh, what are we interested in when we measure a uh, pre Menopausal women's uh, blood levels uh, for hormones. Premenopause at what age? 35, 40? Depends on when they start having symptoms. Uh, we will have some women earlier 
that have uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and we can do a podcast talking about that at another time, but that's just a, there's a whole lot involved in that. But sometimes women that are struggling with polycystic ovarian syndrome, they may be in their 20s or even teenagers. We'll have moms that bring their daughters to us to be treated for PCOS. So in those women, it would be much younger, but the large majority, it's going to be around age 35. But any time that they start experiencing symptoms, it's a good idea to have them tested and get an evaluation by a knowledgeable provider. And that's progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, thyroid. In a premenopausal woman, you would not, there's no need to measure estradiol. She, we would never give estradiol to a premenopausal woman because she's still making her own. And so if you give her estradiol, she's going to have major PMS. Okay. So that's uh, progesterone. And um, the, the next hormone that should be checked uh, and may be uh, optimized, is that testosterone? Testosterone, uh-huh, and thyroid. And um, we also look at DHEA, not because we're necessarily looking to administer DHEA into uh, a younger woman, um, but it can give us some clues if she's got an elevated DHEA that would make us start looking a little more closely for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we, we screen and look at all of the hormones, but except with the exception of estradiol. Okay. Um, how would you administer in a premenopausal uh, woman uh, the testosterone if she would need it? We uh, use perivaginal testosterone. And uh, it's depending on the symptoms. It's just like with men, except the dosages are going to be much smaller. Okay. Um, and for thyroid, uh, we're not just looking at the um, thyroid stimulating hormone. It's the right. free the free T3 level that uh, should be optimized, probably. Right. Absolutely. And with symptoms, because the symptoms are going to you know really dictate treatment, uh, because. Most of the people that come in, they're going to be in the normal range, but it's going to be low normal. And then if they're symptomatic, we give them, give them a little thyroid, symptoms go away. But the TSH really doesn't mean anything. It's, it's an indirect measure of thyroid function. So we look at the symptoms, and then we, we get a good baseline of the hormone levels just to kind of see what we're dealing with. But we don't shoot for numbers really in, in any of our patients. Okay. Again, I have a lot of uh, women coming in to my practice that struggle with weight gain, of course, also young women. And a lot of them always, uh, they all, always say, oh, I have a, a slow metabolism, must be my thyroid. Can, I, can you have that checked? So we check it and a lot of times it's, yeah, it's normal, low normal. I, I know legally we can't much do much about that. We can't uh, give uh, thyroid for that reason to... Uh, you can't give thyroid for weight loss, um, but and we don't. But we look at um, the symptoms and how they feel, and of course, you know, you implement dietary changes and increase activity. If and, and oftentimes when women diet, you know, it reduces the thyroid production. So you have to look at all of that and determine what's going to be the best course of action. But um, we definitely give thyroid uh, in order to try to eliminate symptoms of fatigue, hair loss, you know, I mean, there are 200 different symptoms related to thyroid deficiency, hair, skin, nails, constipation, uh, menstrual irregularities, uh, anxiety, depression can be treated very effectively using thyroid. So very much look at symptoms. Okay. What about uh, DHEA and pregnenolone? Do we have to look at that in a, a young premenopausal woman? We look at it, um, but we don't typically don't give uh, DHEA to someone that's under 40 because women under 40 are very sensitive to DHEA and they'll start breaking out with acne and uh, women don't want that. So generally we don't have to give DHEA to younger women. Okay, and the pregnenolone? Same we always thing. Look at, we always look at pregnenolone, but not everyone will get pregnenolone. It depends on age, and again, we're looking at benefits. So the younger women typically won't need it like older women will. 
Okay. And then uh, as we talked uh, with Keith in the um, interview or uh, live stream about uh, hormones and relationships, maybe we have to touch uh, on that here again. Melatonin. Uh, you said before in that live stream that women are more sensitive to melatonin than men. Uh, so what's the dose that you aim for in optimizing uh, melatonin? It's what they can tolerate. We tell them what will allow them to sleep well through the night and wake up rested, not tired. If they wake up groggy, then they've either taken it too late or it's going to be too much for them because we use a sustained release melatonin. Um, But, and they should notice an increase in dream activity. If you're not dreaming, you're not getting in a good restorated stage of sleep. And that's where cellular repair takes place. So you want to make sure that we're getting an adequate amount of sleep. Okay. And we've got people that take as little as one milligram of melatonin. That's all they can tolerate. And then, like we mentioned, the ER doctor that it took her 200 milligrams before she could, you know, get adequate sleep. But she said that's dramatically changed her life because she always has struggled with sleeping. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and I, I also have heard in other podcasts that melatonin um, also gives uh, antioxidant, uh, uh, anti-cancer uh, properties, but there you have to go beyond uh, 20 milligrams. Is that uh, the same thing in women? Mm -hmm. It's the same thing in women. Um, but I think even if they can't tolerate 20 milligrams, I think they're still going to get benefit from taking melatonin, I still think there's going to be some anti-cancer property that they will get, but um, we just let it be what what they can tolerate without, you know, being in groggy. Okay. So, uh, none. yeah, sure. So I will recap um, for the um, viewers. So what we can do for premenopausal women to optimize their hormones, that's uh, progesterone, that's testosterone, Thyroid, of course, and we talked about DHEA and pregnenolone, uh, not, not, so, uh, not so often, and melatonin, of course. Right, and vitamin D. We look at vitamin D as well because um, most people that come to see us, their vitamin D is lower than even the normal range or it's going to be in the 30s. So we, we definitely look at vitamin D as well. Okay. Uh, what levels are you aiming for, for uh, vitamin D? Because that, there's no real um, symptoms of low vitamin D, so you, you should be aiming for a, a number. Generally, the studies will show us that people get the most benefit when you're in about the 80 to 100 range. And so that's kind of where we want one hours to be. Uh, a minimum of 60. Some studies show that it requires a minimum of 60 before you can reabsorb calcium. So we would like to see it a minimum of 60, but we prefer the 80 to 100 range. That's very high the, uh, for our labs, because our labs are already very happy when you have 20. Right. And, you know, the, the labs, it just everybody can keep in mind, when you see those lab results, all that's given us is an average of everyone that they test. And we're not testing a population of, healthy individuals for the most part, because we're testing people that are in clinics and hospitals. So it's an older, unhealthy population. And, but the range is so broad. It's 30 to 100 is what's considered to be normal. But that's not necessarily optimal. So we want to be in an optimal range where we get the most benefit. Okay. Is there anything more you wanted to add about uh, uh, optimizing premenopausal women or their um, birth control pills or uh, contraceptives, Angie? It's, um, you know, every woman, women, they need to understand that uh, there is, there are things that you can do. You know, a lot of women, I think they don't know and understand because they're not yet menopausal. So they really don't know that there are options out there for them. But the main problem or the complaint that they come in with is just irritability, irritability that they don't really understand where that has come from, that that's not their norm. And then also weight gain and um, loss of interest, you know, in sex drive and stuff. So there are things that we can do and you don't have to wait until you become menopausal. There are things that we can do to help before then. We had a lady last week call in. She's been on hormones for a month. And she said, I told my husband, because he brought her in. This was one of the couples that came in uh, that we were kind of talking about earlier. But she said, um, I can't believe in one month how much better I feel. And it's like, 
I wish that everybody understood that you don't have to accept this. You don't have to suffer. And so that would be my only thing is, and I used to say that all the time, but I had kind of forgotten it until she said it. But you don't have to accept that this is just how it's going to be. You know, there are things that we can do to improve the quality of our health. Okay, Angie, thank you so much for this uh, great podcast on uh, optimizing premenopausal women and their uh, contraceptives. It was uh, very informative for me too. I'm glad to do it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Angie. Talk to you next time. All right, have a good night. Thanks.